unlike the Robbies, the, uh, the, the Vaughns quite often came without notes. <laughs> <laughs> Pens, but no notes. Uh, uh, eulogizing people you love is not something you like to get good at. And, and uh, this, this situation is no different. A couple of disclaimers off the start. First of all, uh, I, like many in this room, uh, bear the, the very unfortunate uh, circumstance of being a child of an architect. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the wires hanging from the ceiling is the Italian light fixture that hasn't arrived. <laughs> uh, and, and, and practically everything you do requires a theory. Uh, However, uh, I'm also blessed to be uh, the child of an architect who practiced with another great architect, and, and for that, I remain grateful. Um, there's something else that I have to get out of the way very quickly, because uh, if I didn't, my mother would probably hit me from behind the head, even from the grave. There were two people in, in, the, in, in our world when I was growing up that uh, I was not required to call Mr. or Mrs. this or that. Two people. There was, of course, Rod, Never Roderick or Mr. Robbery, ever. And the other was Jane Jacobs. Jane was Jane. Not bad company. Not bad company at all. Rod was, was, was uh, profoundly generous. Beyond his wisdom and his brilliance and, and his accomplishments, he was profoundly generous with his time. And I can remember working on a story uh, when... when, when uh, they were moving to, to, it was after my father's death, to, to build a condominium on top of the, the O'Keefe Center. And it shall be the O'Keefe Center in the Sky Dome until I die. Yeah. <laughs> and, and while I'd had uh, stories from my father, or lies from my parents as I often refer to it, but I'd had stories about how the building had been built, um, I asked some of the, the leading architects of that era to walk me through why this project was a masterpiece for a story that never got to air. There was no way I'd ever be able to cut it down to a minute, let alone ten. And Rod walked me around the building and, and showed me how brass and concrete worked, how the engineering was structured, how the span of the awning side was, was unique, told me that I had to talk to Marty Yalis before I could even begin to understand the building, and then took me to lunch. And, and lunch with, with Rod was, was even more fantastic. It was always a piece of paper. He, I don't think he ever chose a restaurant that didn't have paper tablecloths. <laughs> <coughs> and and the, you know, the entire city's history was, was drawn in front of you. And then he said, I actually, I want to take you somewhere else. I want to show you something. And this was, was, was part of the generosity of his spirit that um, will stay with, with all of us. He took me to, to a building on King Street at the corner of Young and showed uh, not what he had done, but what my father had done and, and, and did with such, with such generous awe uh, that was, it was beyond touching about, about how uh, marble that had been, had been uh, pulled out of the ground and grease miles away uh, had been measured within an, uh, a millimeter of having the veins meet up and having the, 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 the fitted edges uh, sort of line up with the center of the of the hallway and how the and how the, the steel had been used and, and 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 spun this story of architectural precision with a slide rule and a translator who was Greek and, and on the floor at, uh, at the construction site back to the quarry in Greece. He, he said what was amazing about this was the math was translated through two or three languages across the telex back and forth and, the, and it landed with precision. He said what I'm not trying to show you is your father's design capability, but his precision with math. And I just want you to respect that. What I really respected was the fact that he found the time to show me something that I had never seen before. And, and he did that throughout my life as, as, a, as a kid in the office next door, but as someone who grew up um, as a colleague and as a friend. And, and from the moment you met him, it was not Mr. Robbie, it was Rod, as I was Adam to him. And, 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 and part of it also, uh, and this is what happens when you lose two parents, is that their friends give you their life back to you. It's one of the great joys of, of, of uh, tough times, is that you get that gift. Uh, and, and part of it was, was a phone call one day, and, and the kids had been working around the house and fixing stuff, and they'd found the, 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 the drawings that were the, the entry drawings for the Canadian Pavilion, Katimovic at Expo 67. They'd been lost for the better part of a decade, somewhere in the house or somewhere in one of the office moves. And they'd found 
these hand-rendered uh, uh, cross-sections of Katimovic and the People Pavilion and the entire project that had won them the, the, one of the great commissions of, of Rod's life. And, and he, he pulled me up uh, with the kids to take a look at these drawings. And they, they are beyond spectacular as a piece of, a piece of art, let alone as a piece of architecture, let alone as, as drawings to be entered into a significant competition. And, and while we marveled at, as, as mile after mile sort of rolled over, what he was more interested in talking about was a book he had written at the time that the drawings were produced. And it was a book that identified the fact that the seven lead architects on the, on the project, uh, the seven lead architects were all in their mid-30s. The most significant you know, commission of, of a decade, led maybe perhaps of a half century, if not a century, one of the most significant statements this, this country has made to the world, and all seven of the architects were immigrants in their mid-30s. It's quite amazing when you think about how tough it is for someone with foreign credentials to even get a job in the city these days. They had climbed to the top of the hill. And I remember my dad was telling the story that when they'd won the, the commission there, he was in the lineup to get a drink at the bar, uh, which is an important part of how Vaughn and, <laughs> and Williams and Robbie get together. But, but someone in front of them had said that, 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 uh, that a bunch of immigrants had won the contest. <laughs> Actually, I think it was a bunch of fucking immigrants had won the contest. <laughs> And my father and Rod were behind him, tapped him on the shoulder and said, they aren't fucking immigrants, they're fucking great architects. <laughs> but the book that he wrote at that time was not a book about being, uh, you know, his, his experience as an architect and what it takes to win a significant commission. He wrote a book about what it means for immigrants in their mid-30s, years and sometimes months into their career, to be accepted in a community and valued in a community and given responsibilities and a future in a community. And what that said about the society that he had chosen to move his family to. And that book is, is perhaps a greater uh, testament to his genius than anything he ever built. To recognize that in the process of building a great building while you're building that great building is quite something. And there are stories that flow from that which, were, which, which disgraced both their parents, and I won't talk about it. <laughs> but but it, was, it was an extraordinary time, and, and he was at the forefront of his profession, but more importantly than that, he was at the forefront of his country, speaking about the things that mattered to him. And that was a large part of who Rod was. Angus, in, in the most loving way I think I've ever heard the word used, called him a megalomaniac. He may have been, but it wasn't for something of selfish or, or personal reason. It was about the next big idea that he could either draw or speak to or embrace or support. And that brings us to the Sky Dome. Uh, the Sky Dome was, was another chapter in, in, in the lives we shared. And, 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 and Rod was, was, was passionate about this. But at this point in his career, had been reduced in some ways as, as firms grew around him, as the city grew around him. He, had, in some ways, had been reduced uh, in capacity by, 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 by fate. And, and, and he, he, he entered because he had, the, he had the answer. He entered the competition because he had the answer. It had come to him and his partners you know, on the back of a napkin, on the paper, paper, the, the paper cover of a, of a table somewhere. And, and he had built this extraordinary thing. And what had happened in the years intervening after it was constructed, he had won, it had been celebrated, uh, is, is that uh, events had conspired to take it away from him again. And, and I was working at this point as a journalist at CBC, and the All-Star Game, I think there's a photograph that shows it was coming to town. It was a few years after the opening. And I had known the backstory of, of the struggle of the family pulling together to keep the firm together as, as Enid and, and, and Rod and my mom had often done, and, and my dad to lesser degrees. Uh, but I, I know that this, this project was, was an extraordinary achievement on a very private level for the family and for Rod, above and beyond the architecture and the public accolades. And I knew that the building was going to be put on display to, to the world in a way that it hadn't been before. And so I thought as a young producer at the CBC Radio, it would be great to get the architect on to talk about what happens when one of your buildings gets put on a stage like this. What do you feel? And I called up Rod and I said, hi, I'd like to put you on the radio. And he didn't want to talk. 
he was hurt. He was really, really hurt. And he said, listen, you know, I'll do it for you, but there's a rule. You can't ask me about the fees. And you can't ask me about the way I was treated. And I'll talk about the building. And so we did the traditional pre-interview, and, and, and one of the things he loved about the building was the only building he said he ever built that the roof didn't leak. <laughs> he said, if only I had known. <laughs> If only I'd known if you create a moving roof, it doesn't leak. It's only when you put them standing still that they have a problem. <laughs> years, of, years of suffering would have been lost. He said, but I don't want to talk about the rest of it. I just want to talk about what I like about this building. And I said, fine. And I put very careful notes to Joe Cote not to talk about it, to focus it on this, and where to stay away from it. And I tuned in the next morning to hear the, the interview executed, which is a nervous time for anyone. And on, on to the show... On came Rod in the introduction and, and, and the talk about the, the non-leaking roof. And something happened. Rod suddenly started talking about what went wrong with the fees. And what went wrong with the way in which the building was built. And why it was unfair. And his bitterness. And, and, and it was a very tough thing for an architect to talk about publicly. And I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified that something had gone wrong, that something had been said in the studio pre-interview and, 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 and I'd betrayed a trust and that I'd, I'd set this up for a moment of disappointment. And I got off, uh, got off air and I, I, I called him and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And he said, no, no, thank you. Thank you, I needed to get that out of my system. And, I, and then he said something which I think really speaks to who he was as a person. He said, there are young architects in this city who will be screwed over by greed in the future, and they need us to speak. He had taken what was a very painful and a very difficult moment and turned it into not just a cathartic moment, but something that had meaning for other people. That's, that's a rare quality in a profession such as architecture or any other profession. It's a rarer quality still in people who have to live their lives under challenges that sometimes put you right to the brink of your very existence. But in that moment, Rod found a way to speak for his colleagues, those that he had mentored, those that he'd been partners to, those that he was a rival for, and found a way to create meaning out of a tough time. That's what being a human is all about. And when you eulogize somebody, that's the part you want to speak to, and that's the part I hope I have. But I also want to end with one last observation, very quickly. Actually, two. <laughs> two. One is, is, is um, he did have a sense of humor. <laughs> and his passing should not go without a rather, a rather dark <laughs> piece of humor on my own behalf. I'm not going to get into the details, but let's just say that, that, that his intestines and his ability to, 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 to create shit at the end of the day <laughs> was, was somewhat compromised. And I think one of the reasons he, he left us so quickly was that he was determined not to live his life full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> that, would <not> be <laughs> that would not be the Rod Robbie that we all love and cherish and remember and celebrate. He was never, ever full of crap. <laughs> but he was also, and this is, I think, um, perhaps uh, another, another note that, that, that requires observation. He and my father worked together from before I was born to after. My dad had played a large role in bringing him to Toronto. When, when Peter Dickinson was looking for architects to grow the firm, somehow Rod Robbie's name had come up and somehow it was my father's responsibility to bring him into Toronto to get him the job at, at, at the firm. Uh, at the, I guess it was Page and Steely at that time. But there was, there was movement coming across. And they brought Rod down uh, from Ottawa. And Izzy Sharp from the Four Seasons was, was having a house designed. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> They had a meeting, and, and, and it, was not a, it was not your typical meeting. My dad and Peter Dickens were just taking the piss out of Izzy. They designed a, a, a television uh, viewing room, of a rec room in the basement that had a four-foot ceiling. And they were trying to convince him that, that, that all, you, you watch television sitting down anyways. 
Why'd you need standing room? You know, crawl into the room, sit down, watch the TV, get over with it. And Rob was like, I can't believe that they're talking to this man this way. He's, he's the client. And afterwards, my, my dad said, okay, let's, 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 let's go for a drink. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And, and <laughs> Rod never drank until he met my father. He was, he was a good man. But uh, Rod said, said, but it's not lunch. I said, I know. I didn't say go eat. I said, go drink. <laughs> but Rod and my dad... Uh, Rod, and, and you can see it in the family, Rod, Rod never looked forward without also looking back. My dad was very different. But, but longer than any marriage, longer than any, any partnership, longer than any career, longer than even relationships within the family, Rod and my dad were friends from the minute they met to the minute my dad left. And, and it tells you, uh, you know, my father was very good at leaving. Rod was very good at keeping, and keeping people around him, and keeping people engaged, and keeping focused, and thinking outside themselves. He, he was my father's better angel as a partner in a lot of ways. And, and to that, I know that on behalf of my sisters, uh, how grateful we are to the Robbies that that, that partnership happened before all of us were born. It, it is it is his friendship to my dad that is the most personal memory, the most profound memory, and the, and the most everlasting thing in my dad's life. And, and uh, that's important to me on a very personal level. And so thank you. Thank you.